I'm a developmental biologist, and indeed a very passionate developmental biologist, and the embryos really caught my attention from my first uh, days at college. And since then, I've been working in, with embryos or with developmental biology. I entered into the field in the 80s. So at that time, developmental biology was mainly experimental embryology. And the, from um, this time to now, developmental biology has extraordinary progress and change as um, the majority of other disciplines. And this change has been possible because of the incorporation of molecular and genetic uh, approaches and new techniques, techniques <coughs> excuse me, because of the introduction of new model organisms that although we need to go over of uh, using the, these kinds of models, still I, I, I think they are very, very useful, and also because the, uh, the incorporation of uh, comparative and evolutionary insights from genomics, and of course the great advance with the techniques of Im imaging. So this has, uh, in my opinion, placed developmental biology at the forefront of science, and uh, this is also in the consciousness of the general public. And as you all know, it's not infrequent that uh, issues uh, in relation with developmental biology questions such as um, uh, cloning or therapeutic uh, cloning or reproductive uh, cloning or stem cell biology are at the uh, head news uh, or at the, head, at the headlines of uh, the news. So I will start, the already has been presented, uh, but I will start um, saying, so the first part of my talk is just to introduce a, a few concepts that I, I think are basic for, for, for our field, for developmental biology, and then I will try uh, to give uh, my opinion or which have been the main contributions of developmental biology to the uh, human health in these past two, three decades. Uh, so the first uh, question, and the um, a major question, is how we go from this uh, very pretty cell, that is the fertilized egg, to a whole organism, that the pretty girl, that is the daughter of one of my collaborators. <laughs> so how we go from one cell to 200 different types of cells? This is a major question that, is, that of course, we only approach uh, in by parts or um, step by step. But this is not only the problem. So the problem is how this happens, how these 200, more than 200 different types of cells occur, but with a defined pattern. So this is under a high control, is highly controlled and ordered. And this is what in developmental biology we call pattern formation. And this is indeed a very basic concept uh, that um, at, on um, a different size scale affects most as aspects of biomedicine from the subcellular level to the uh, organ, organ systems. Uh, part information occurs in the formation of the embryo in the development at the same time of all those uh, uh, important and very basic processes that I'm just showing in this slide are taking place, place. So there is a lot of proliferation, of course, intercellular signaling. The cells interact and communicate between them, and this is basic, particularly for the uh, embryo development, differentiation, cell motility, cell shape, cell death, and differential addiction, among others. Just to illustrate this, I'm going to show this and uh, this, um, mm, I tried before and it ran. This movie uh, on the, uh, on, okay, here, uh, this is a chick embryo at the beginning of the castula in which some of the cells of the epiblast uh, have been electroporated with a, a red fluorescent marker. And what uh, we, uh, and what we are going to, to see is how these cells move and reorganize to make the third layer of mesoblast of the embryo. So if you see here only the fluorescent, oh, stopped, excuse me. So the cells are moving so towards the center, well, it stops, I'll try to explain, 
uh, to the center, to the midline of the embryo where the primitive sticks form, and the cells ingress and continue mo moving in between now the ectoderm and the uh, endoderm or the outer and inner layer to make the um, mesoderm the intermediate layer. So this is occurring at the same time that cells are differentiating, changing gene expression, and, uh, and all the processes that I mentioned before are applying in this, in this moment. To me, this is an illustration of the complexity at, at, as well as the beauty of uh, developmental biology. Well, pattern formation is something that occurs step, step by step. It's not that there is a blueprint of pattern formation. It goes step by step, and each new step is built upon the previous steps. And here I'm showing this in, uh, for limb development that is uh, one of the models in which my, or the, or the main model in which my lab is working. We go from this very, uh, from this early limb bud in which uh, we can um, only distinguish two elements, the blue layer, out li out outside li layer of the ectoderm, and an internal core of, mes of mesodermal cells, and these progressively are developing, growing, and the bones, the pattern of bones, uh, muscles, nerves, uh, etc., are shaping in this limb. And some of the processes like um, gene, differential gene expression with um, genes that direct or determine uh, cartilage formation or cell death, apop uh, um, removal of cell death by apoptosis that occurs in between our digits to, free, to make them free or proliferation, all this occur at the same time. So to, when we want to understand uh, this kind of processes, it's good that we make models that try to integrate our uh, way of thinking or our knowledge, and these models uh, allow to test and, and propose new experiments uh, to check uh, the validity of the model and to progress in our knowledge. Uh, pattern formation is still not understood or very, um, very limited uh, understood. And one of the models more used and that applies in some systems like uh, Drosophila is the model of positional information directed, direct, directed by gradient of morphogenes uh, here shown. But still, uh, there are other uh, models possible, like the reaction diffusion models, in which interactions between molecules in, the, in, in uniform fields of, uh, of uh, cells end up in a cell autonomous manner, uh, giving up of uh, quite uh, complex patterns of organization, and this is um, one of the topics we are presently working with mutants in which the pattern of the digits that you see in the top row is uh, highly disrupted. Well, uh, another, uh, another aspect I would like to, to mention, and that has been uh, also um, mm, mm, introduced by, previous, by the previous speakers, is the, highly, the high conservation between species. 30, about 30 years ago, um, humans were human, and mice were mice, and flies were flies. And we thought that only a minority of genes would be conserved between species, so that only a handful of genes would be similar in these species. But this, you, you now grant, uh, know, well know, that this is not the case. And that uh, indeed, what is controlling development in this case, but many other processes, are uh, the genes, and um, not only the genes, but, only, but also the mechanisms are highly conserved from uh, organisms as separate as, uh, or uh, initially thought to be separate as flies or, or humans. And this started in the 70s, when mm, studying the um, uh, homeotic uh, mutations in the fly, uh, it was found that the homeotic genes were conserved in flies and, and genes, and this is, of course, evidence of a um, common ancestry and supporting the evolutionary theory. This was done by uh, uh, Louis Guerin and the Robertis and other labs. And 
consequence or um, implication of this is that since mechanisms and genes are highly conserved, we can use models to understand how human biology and human disease is produced. And we can um, extract very relevant information for the use of models. And even more, I would say that it would be, a, a, and it would be um, most, uh, the best approach to use the simplest model possible to answer the question under the biological question under, uh, under uh, a study. Those are uh, the models that are more common used in developmental uh, bi biology. So I, I now go move to my second to the second part of my of my talk, and I'm going to uh, try to explain what I think the contributions developmental biology, the major contributions, uh, uh, has done uh, to human health. Uh, the regulation of fertility, I won't talk about this because it's very obvious how all the techniques of uh, helping human reproduction problems, that uh, indeed human reproduction is a very inefficient un uh, process uh, and in vitro fertilization, how all these benefits uh, benefited uh, and could be rapidly implemented into the clinic because of the knowledge uh, gathered by uh, developmental biologists. Uh, a second major contribution is the identification <coughs> on the understanding of birth defects, and I will talk a little more about this in a second. Uh, a third uh, contribution is the identification of teratogens. Uh, I won't talk much about this. I have worked in the past a little bit with uh, the implications of thalidomide, for example, in the generation of the focomelia, and uh, it's, um, it's easy to understand how uh, teratogens, that are, uh, terato means a uh, monster, so th these are uh, um, uh, chemicals or substances that produce monsters during development, uh, how developmental biology can really help in uh, identifying and understanding how the possible teratogens uh, work. Um, another point uh, I would uh, briefly comment is the new therapies uh, based, mainly based in stem cell uh, biology. And finally, the relationship that I think is a close relationship between cancer and developmental biology, as the previous speaker already uh, mentioned. So I'm going to concentrate in these uh, three issues. I'm going to start with birth <coughs> defects. Well, in, maybe it's not known by the general population, but there is in about 2 and 5% of the newborns have um, a birth malformation. So had had some problem during development. And um, mm, following accidents, birth defects are the highest cause of death in childhood, and it accounts also, or the birth defects, defects account also for more than half of the uh, pediatrician hospitalization, <coughs> apart from, from being a um, cause of high suffering for the, for the child and for the families. So the, as uh, uh, Dr. Warner just explaining, uh, once the genome was new, this interest in knowing the function of genes made that many genes were either destructed or overexpressed or misexpressed. And, the, and this, the result of this was the generation of a great amount of animal models. And we found that some of these animal models <coughs> reproduce very faithful um, some of the human malformations. And I'm just, there are many, many examples. I'm just going to give two examples in which uh, uh, we've been working at my lab. One is First is sirenomelia, a very devasta devastating human malformation of the, low, um, of the caudal part of the body in w characterized by the fusion of, of the limbs. So we and others have found that decreasing BMP signaling from the caudal part of the body leads to this malformation in, in, in human, in, excuse me, in, in mouse to models that reproduce uh, the uh, human condition and it's a completely copy of the human condition. Having an animal model is, is, is a, a, a terrible advantage because we can go 
to, we can proceed to analyze how this defect starts and progress. So we know the onset and we know the mechanisms at the cellular and molecular model that uh, are uh, working. And so we can understand, we can try to prevent that this occurs and we can manage or provide uh, some of the, um, uh, some suggestions to manage these problems. A second um, malformation I'm going to mention is the malformations of the hands. They are not so, uh, unless they are uh, associated with other malformations, they are not so devastating. And uh, here we have uh, an animal model that reproduces this uh, uh, ectrodactyly or crab uh, hand, and that uh, is also under uh, a study now in, in our lab. So from the, first, from the birth, birth uh, defects, Developmental biology has, um, in my opinion, has contributed to the understanding and also when once we identify the genes or the pathways that are affected, we understand why some of these birth defects are pleiotropic because the same pathways that are used for some processes during development are used uh, once and again at different places and times. And so this is why we end up with very difficult or very complex uh, phenotypes. And also we can uh, uh, understand um, how different locus give the same phenotypes because they are in the same pathway or they are connected in some way. In some way. And finally, we can um, propose candidate genes that uh, serve for uh, give uh, um, advice to couples in the risk of having um, babies with, uh, uh, with, um, um, with, birth with congenital defects. Uh, a second um, contribution, major contribution, is uh, the contribution of developmental biology uh, to the stem cell uh, biology. Indeed, uh, embryonic stem cells were developed by developmental biologists. And we all, I think we all agree, or probably many of us will agree, that uh, stem cells are probably uh, the mo best tool that has been developed in the last year. Because the possibilities that this, that having cells that, you ca that can be directed to differentiate it in, if they are embryonic, in every kind of uh, um, cell type, or uh, according to the pluripotence, uh, so the possibility of this technique for the future is huge. So um, um, embryonic stem cell, cells were developed from the inner cell ma mass of the, uh, of the blastocyst, and uh, they were developed in, the, in 1981 by um, e e Martin Evans and Gail Martin at the same time. Martin Evans got the a Nobel Prize together with Capecchi and Smith is for the, our following contribution to the generation of the uh, um, knockouts and gen targeting. Uh, Gail didn't continue to work uh, in, 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 this, in this field. Um, so in the past, in the past, recent past years, the, uh, most of the effort has concentrated in uh, generating this kind of uh, cells uh, stem cells, uh, different kinds of stem cells, uh, embryonic, adults, uh, fetal, and also in, um, in analyzing how a normal, a somatic, and well differentiated cell can be reprogrammed to become a stem cells. And this is what has been called induced uh, stem cells. So uh, all this inform all, uh, from all those studies in the past years, a lot of information has been got, gathered. But I think, and not only me, uh, I think many of us think that we are now entering into a second phase or a next phase or era in the study of uh, the uh, stem cells that is more holistic. I mean, we now, we now know how, or some labs know how, to differentiate stem cells to cardiac cells or other types of cells, neuron cells. But it doesn't mean that we know how to make a heart. So now the possibilities are very restricted. 
And, and my opinion is that um, stem cell biology, together with developmental biology, should work in uh, identified, which is all these uh, kind of uh, programs of information that connect uh, pattern formation with uh, cell differentiation. And the uh, final uh, issue I'm going to, to deal with is the connection between developmental biology and cancer. Uh, there are many connections um, that uh, not only relating in, because uh, I'm going to concentrate it in the topic that some pathways that are used during development and then are almost um, uh, off in the adult life, they are reactivated in some ca cancers. But there are other ways in which uh, developmental biology connects with cancer, so, uh, such as, for example, the control of angio angiogenesis, that is also very important, and epithelial mesenchymal transformation for metastasis, <coughs> etc. But I'm going to concentrate in a pathway, in a very important pathway, that is the headshot pathway. Headshot is a gene that was uh, identified in Drosophila in a screening for genes affecting the development of Drosophila that was done by Nuslen Borjan and um, Witchhouse in, in the late 70s, and that was also a Nobel, a Nobel Prize. Uh, it received the name of headshot because of the modifications in the larva that gave this descriptive uh, phenotype similar to, to a headshot. In the early 90s, the gene was uh, identified in, in flies, was cloned in flies, and also in vertebrates. And uh, in vertebrates, there were three uh, genes. I'm going to concentrate in Shonic. The Shonic headshot uh, is a secret, very potent uh, molecule with very important functions during development. Okay. It's, um, it's expressed in the uh, hands, in hands node and is controlling the expression of nodal only in the left right side of the body. And this is what is going at the end to control our, uh, the position of the organs in the, uh, uh, in, of our internal uh, organs. It is expressed in the notochord and controls dorsal ventral pattern in the, uh, in the neural tube. It is expressed uh, in, in the midline and controls uh, the midline. It is expressed in some cells in the limb bud, in the posterior border of the limb bud, the CPA or zone of polarizing activity, and controlling the uh, shape and morphology of the uh, digits in, in our hand. The mutant, Sony Hedgehog mutant, is a real monster. It's a cyclop, has a proboscide, and many uh, alterations in the body as, as, in, the, as in the limb bats. The pathway is unique. It also has uh, um, quite particularities, uh, the pathway, and was also discovered and mainly analyzed in Drosophila, but found to be highly conserved in vertebrates. This is the cell producing uh, sonic, this is the, uh, or headshot, this is the cell receiving the, excuse me, this is the cell receiving headshot signaling and this is the cell not receiving headshot signaling. I would call your attention to the smoothing protein that needs to be active in order for the signal uh, transduction to occur. So it was found that some cancers, particularly these two but many others, the basal cell carcinoma and the medulloblastoma, uh, activated, uh, have a um, higher activation of the, of the headshot pathway. So there is a common pathway for uh, development and for, uh, and for cancer. But what is really interesting, and I like it very much, is that in the 1950s, there were farmers in, in Idaho, I think it was, that identified that the lambs that, were, that had pasture in meadows in which they were very rich in this corn lily uh, were cycloped. And so there were scientists that identified what was the component in the plant that was the cause of the, uh, of the cyclop in the lambs. And this uh, was called, this, uh, this uh, chemical was called cyclopamine. Cyclopamine is a small molecule that inhibits the headshot pathway because it binds to an 
uh, inhibits smoothen. So this could be a target. So the first idea was this is going, this is a target, excuse me. Mm. Okay. So this is, could be a target for, um, uh, for uh, treating those cancers. Indeed, this was not really the case, or it's not going to be the case because cyclopamine has not a good pharmacokinetics and has some difficulties, but um, artificial molecules are, are, are synthesized in the same way as, uh, as, um, as cyclopamine and all, already starting uh, to, be try, to, to perform clinical trials. So this is the summary of what I think I've presented, and I just uh, would like to end with something that has been already mentioned here, but I also was thinking about mentioning is this present day uh, controversy between uh, basic and uh, applied research. In my opinion, it's very difficult to know ahead of time what is going to be applied, what is going to be really useful for us in the future. And there are many uh, discoveries that had paid off many years after, more than 20 years after. And uh, so this is a caveat uh, we may uh, all think about. Thank you very much for your attention.